Hello, everybody. It looks like we're about ready to start maybe a tad early. Um, this week is especially exciting for a couple different reasons. We have our applicants coming, so welcome to all of them. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing more of you tomorrow and in the future. And I think we're especially also lucky to have Dr. Thomas Berg graciously agree to, to join us and talk more today. For our visitors, uh, Dr. Bird is really a pioneer uh, in the field of neurogenetics um, and has been instrumental with a long history of research, clinical work, and publications in discovering and describing uh, the effect of genes on a, a wide variety of neurologic conditions, including Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and ataxia spondylitisia, and sarcoma tooth, and the list continues and continues if you delve further. Um, and I, I think as a clinician, what's especially exciting is, is not just the, the research, but really extensively describing how these genes influence the wide manifestations of many of these disorders. Um, at all levels, including motor and movement manifestations and cognition and psychiatric. Um, so I think that's really an incredibly valuable contribution that sometimes is, is missing from more basic science research. Um, so truly being a clinical researcher um, at all levels and has clearly been an inspiration to a lot of our own trainees, um, some of whom have, have stayed on as faculty and followed in his mold, like Dr. Jayadev and Dr. Marie Davis, um, who are continuing on in the field of neurogenetics and its application uh, to a variety of different disorders and conditions. Uh, but today, I'm excited because he has also written a book, uh, Can You Help Me? from Oxford Press, available at brick and mortar local independent bookstores and probably some not as cute uh, online large retailers, but available anywhere you choose to look for it. Um, and, and I've read the book and I really, really enjoyed it because I think it gives um, a, another layer of perspective to what it has been like working over many years with, with, with not just individual patients and research subjects, but with whole families and watching the evolution of these diseases and how they affect entire families over generations. Um, so I think that that's really a, a whole nother perspective. Um, that is seldom discussed in these kind of forums, but I think is something that's really of interest and an inspiration to a lot of us, uh, no matter what our specific interest or field is. Um, so I would encourage you all to, to read it. Um, I'm excited to hear more about his bird's eye view, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> um, and you probably won't, shouldn't. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Bird. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for the commercial. <laughs> so this book is uh, titled, Can You Help Me Inside the Turbulent World of Huntington's Disease? And, and the background, why did I write this book? So I retired from clinical neurology a few years ago, uh, and I realized a couple of things. Uh, one is, that I had seen so many patients and families with this disease that even though I retired and was no longer seeing them, I couldn't get them out of my mind. I truly could not do it. In fact, my wife can tell you I was dreaming about these families. Uh, and I did a little back of the envelope uh, calculation because I'd been here for so many decades and although this is said to be a rare disease, I could compute that I had seen more than a thousand people with this disease, which is amazing, I think. Uh, and it's, it, that should tell you that it's not a rare disease. Uh, and you can get in arguments about what's rare, what's common, so forth. It's not common, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and diabetes and cancer and so forth. But it's not rare, like some extremely rare diseases that we also see in our medical genetics clinic. I call it uncommon, but not rare. Uh, and I realized that it was one of the most, it was probably the most fascinating clinical disease that I had ever seen over my many years of experience. I hadn't seen any other disease that had the range of manifestations of this disease at all. It, 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 nothing else, as far as I could tell, in clinical neurology for me compared with this disease. And I realized that the general public did not know about this 
you can ask the general public about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and so forth. They know about that, something about it. Huntington's disease, you usually get a blank look. They don't know what this disease is. So I thought it was important to bring this disease to their attention because of this amazing range of clinical manifestations. And because although it's an uncommon disease, it's an important disease. Uh, it is a model of a genetic disease, genetic degenerative disease of the brain. It's always been considered a model and it still is. And it's a model in terms of mechanisms, both genetic and, and uh, molecular and biochemical mechanisms. Uh, and it's a model in terms of potential treatments, which I'll uh, touch on uh, at, the, at the end of my talk. So it's fascinating, it's important, it's a model, so I felt I needed to write about it. The book is dedicated to this woman. This is Amelia Schultz. And the upper left-hand picture is from 1962. And uh, that's a patient in a medical genetics clinic here at the University of Washington. The man in the uh, dark uh, coat on the right with glasses is Arno Moltolsky, who founded the field of uh, medical genetics in 1957. Uh, and he's interviewing this patient. I don't know what the patient has, but it's could be Huntington's disease because Huntington's, even back then, was one of the most common diseases seen in the medical genetics clinic here at the University of Washington. Uh, and the woman looking intently at the patient in the middle on the left with the dark hair and the glasses is Amelia Schultz. For you connoisseurs, the man in glasses sitting behind her is George Stamagoinopoulos, but we, we won't go there. Uh, so Amelia was hired by Arnold Moltolsky to be a social worker for his genetics clinic. And there had never been a medical genetic social worker before. So she was a pioneer. Uh, and I ran across Amelia when I did my medical genetics fellowship and developing our medical genetics clinic. She remained our genetics counselor and she specialized in the families of Huntington's disease because she recognized them as so needy. Uh, and this is Amelia this year, 2019. She's 104. Amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, so I want to give you some examples. And what my book is about is examples of the vast range of manifestations of this amazing genetic disease of the brain. And let me begin by showing you a few examples. If I can get this to work. Adrian, Adrian promised me that I just need, oh, there's the arrow. All right. What am I not doing? I've got my little. You just keep talking. Yeah, so I've got the little. You just should be able to press that and it should go, right? So this uh, this is a little boy. <laughs> is, this, is this crying? Is, yeah. just, is, it, is that Boston? No. This is just the audio. Just like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you can tell he's pretty uncoordinated. So this is a, uh, a four and a half year old boy who has Huntington's disease. It's not the kind of patient you think of when you think of Huntington's disease, but he has Huntington's disease, and he died with Huntington's disease at age six. His father was also our patient, uh, and we saw his father and followed him with Huntington's Of course, he died before his father. So 
had 25 years as a Ben Jam company in Seattle. They had that store in Seattle and over in Portland and Vancouver, uh, BC. And uh, after each 50, we go to Washington, DC, and uh, in DC, Doris and Al were down at the hub. So, this man is 92, and he has Huntington's disease. So we got a five-year-old with Huntington's disease, we got a 92-year-old with Huntington's disease. Isn't that incredible? How many neurologic brain diseases do you know of where the patient can be five and have the disease and be 92 and have the disease? And this man is still alive today at age 92, uh, in a retirement home uh, and assisted living. So that's just one kind of incredible manifestation of this disease that we've dealt with uh, over the years. So, so yeah. Sorry about that. So when people ask me, you know, what is this disease like? Uh, it's not like anything else, as I've already told you, but it's a little like Alzheimer's, but not exactly. It's a little like frontotemporal dementia, but not exactly. It's a little like Parkinson's, but not exactly. CJD, but not exactly. Schizophrenia, but not exactly. Tourette's, but not exactly. It overlaps with all of these neurologic and psychiatric diseases, but it's not exactly like any of them. So to, to back up, the disease was described by this man, George Huntington, in 1872. It's an amazing story, and I can just give you the highlights. He uh, was born and raised in East Hampton, Long Island, and his father had been a general practitioner, and his grandfather had been a general practitioner. And there was a family living in East Hampton that had hereditary chorea, it was called, and it was progressive. And he had followed his father on rounds, so he had seen this family multiple times over many years. He himself then went to medical school and became a family physician and followed the family. And when he joined a medical society, part of joining the society required him giving a presentation on something of medical illness, so he gave a presentation on Korea, and he specifically described this family that he and his father and grandfather had followed for three generations. Uh, and they wrote it up, and it got published. Uh, and that was the only paper he ever published. But other people in this country and in Europe began to see families with hereditary Korea, and they came across his paper, and they would say, well, we're describing a paper like that family that Huntington described. And so it became known as Huntington's Korea. We now call it Huntington's disease because not everyone has Korea. So it's an incredible story, one paper, one doctor, and this whole disease. Uh, and he was right on the button in a very short description. I call it HD shows variable expression, but this is what he described. He described that they had chorea, they had a movement disorder, and it was progressive. He described that they had behavioral problems and personality changes. He described that they got depressed and that they were high risk for suicide. All of that is true. Uh, Alice Wexler has written a book about Huntington's disease, academic book about it, called The Woman Who Walked Into the Sea. One of his patients who had the disease walked uh, into the Atlantic Ocean and drowned because she was so depressed. And the title of the book is The Woman Who Walked Into the Sea. And they had cognitive decline, although it was often relatively mild and late in the disease. And he didn't know the term autosomal dominant inheritance. It hadn't been described yet, except in a few pea plants in Czechoslovakia. Uh, but he was right that it was hereditary. He was right that it was adult onset. He was right that it affected males and females. And he accurately said 
that if you were at risk for it and lived long enough, like beyond the age of 60 or so, and didn't develop the disease, your children would not get it. So not bad for someone who knew nothing about genetics. Uh, there were, in the subsequent 100 years, 100 and some years, we've learned a few more things about the disease that Huntington didn't know. We now know that although it affects the whole brain, it particularly affects the medium spiny neurons in the caudate uh, and the putamen. And here's an MRI scan of one of our patients with Huntington's disease, and the red arrow is pointing to the area of the caudate. I don't have a control here for you, but the caudate is nearly gone. It's flat instead of pushing out into the lateral ventricle. So there's severe caudate atrophy in this individual. And then the final thing that Huntington didn't know was the gene that is associated with this disease, and it's called the Huntington gene. Um, and it has this unique characteristic of being a CAG repeat expansion within the gene, and most of you know about that. Uh, and it became, it's one of the reasons it's a model for a genetic disease, because it was one of the earliest diseases to be found with these re triplet repeat expansions. And there's a general association of the size of that expansion with age of onset of the disease, such that uh, if you're in the 40s and 50s, you can see full penetrance down there. If that's the size of your repeat expansion, you will develop the disease sometime during your life. Uh, if it's smaller than that, in the 30s, you may or may not develop the disease, but that's still abnormal. And if it's a lot larger, 60 or greater, you often develop very early onset of the disease. And so the two examples I gave you on video, that little boy, his CAG expansion was 160. Incredible size. One of the largest that's ever been reported. And that man who was 92 years old, his repeat expansion was 38. Which, and his onset of symptoms was probably in his uh, early 80s. So that those two people fit this trajectory. Uh, but within any repeat expansion, you cannot predict age of onset because there's a lot of a range for any expansion. But this has formed the basis for a genetic test for this disease. When I started in neurology, there was no test for the disease and people had to, had to wait until they were in their 60s and 70s to know whether or not they had escaped. In 1993, this was discovered and it was quickly uh, transformed into a specific blood DNA genetic test for the disease. So if you were at 50% risk for the disease, you could have a blood sample taken, and within a few days, you would know whether you'd inherited the mutation causing this disease or not, and you would know where you were in the scale. Uh, and that has produced the genetic testing conundrum in this and many other diseases. And of course, the question is to test or not to test. There's no cure for this disease. There's no effective treatment for the disease. So why would you want to know if you had inherited it or not? And families have to decide that. It's fascinating to realize that when families were asked this back before a test was available and they were asked, if a, if a test was available, would you want to have it? And uh, three quarters of the people said yes. Now that the test is available in this country, it's about 10 or 15% of the people at risk. So once they were really faced with having to have this test or not, if they want it, most people decide not to because they think it would be depressing, it would be too anxiety producing, it would be too stressful, and there's not anything that can be particularly done about it. But the test is there, it's available, and lots of people decide to have the test, and it's one of the busiest uh, things that keep our genetic counselors uh, occupied. So that's kind of the background, and I, I have a chapter in the book about individual responses to genetic testing, people who genetic, 
tested positive, people who were genetically tested negative, people who were in the gray zone where you're not sure what to tell them, uh, uh, people who were elderly, people who were young, and how they respond to that. And I can tell you, whatever response you can imagine happens. It all depends on the social personality makeup of that particular individual and family. So all kinds of things that happen, including people who are genuinely joyous about the result versus people who kill themselves because of the result. So again, just the incredible range of experience you see with this disease. So uh, the, the people, as, you, as, I, as I will get to, have lots of problems with impulsivity and psychiatric behavior and sometimes violence. Uh, and uh, they lose their jobs. They don't have much money. They're often homeless. And they frequently come in contact with the legal and mental health system, the police, emergency health services, state hospitals, attorneys, government agencies, courts, and judges, you name it. Uh, and this picture represents the, uh, the reason for the title of my book, which is, Can You Help Me? So this is a picture of the Walla Walla State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington, the town so nice they named it twice. Um, and I received, early in my career, I received a letter that was scratched in a scrawl on tablet paper, and it said, Dear Dr. Bird, can you help me? I'm in the Walla Walla State Penitentiary. I have Huntington's Korea. I'm getting worse. I'm embarrassed by it. I'm mistreated by the other inmates. I'm having a terrible experience. And I want to know that when I get out of here, is there a clinic where someone can see me for this disease? And I sent him back a very brief letter saying, thank you for writing. Yes, we have a clinic. Yes, we know about this disease. You know, and, and the message, and I assumed he was stuck in here that we might never see him. Or if we did, it would be years off. So a couple months later, he appeared in our clinic. And it turns out that Walla Walla was packed full. Inmates were sleeping in the hallways, and the warden had told him, he told the warden he had this disease. The warden told him, if you can find a clinic that will follow you on the outside, we'll discharge you. <laughs> he didn't tell me that. <laughs> but it worked. He showed the warden my letter, and uh, he went right out the front door. He was on pardon. Uh, he was not completely off the hook, but he was on uh, pardon. Uh, and it turns out he was in for. Uh, uh, basically obsessive stealing. He couldn't stop stealing. And when he got out, he still couldn't stop stealing. And he continued to do it. I would get phone calls from his parole officer. He was not pardoned, he was on parole. I would get calls from his parole officer, Dr. Bird, please tell him to stop stealing. We don't want to have to send him back. Uh, and he unfortunately made the mistake of burglarizing the mansion of one of the most prominent families in Seattle. And he got caught, uh, and they found out he was on parole from Walla Walla, and they said no. And so he went back and disappeared into the prison. But can you help me, Dr. Bird? Can you help me? I have this disease. And that question stuck with me for the rest of my career. So this is Creedmoor State Asylum on Long Island in New York City actually not that far from East Hampton, where Huntington described the disease. And this is a classic uh, American state hospital. At its peak, it had other buildings. At its peak, it had 7,000 patients, and probably two or three times as many staff. And so it was a city uh, within a city. And its most famous occupant was Woody Guthrie. So if People in the general public know anything about Huntington's disease. They often know that Woody Guthrie had Huntington's disease, and in fact, he did. And he was a patient in Creedmoor for several years. He didn't die there. He was, he was in at least three different state hospitals, uh, but he died in a state hospital 
and was the most famous resident of Creedmoor. So our equivalent of Creedmoor is this place. This is Western State Hospital in Stillicum, Washington, a few miles south of Tacoma. Uh, it, the, our state used to have three state hospitals, Western, Eastern, and Northern. Northern has been closed, but Western and Eastern are still open. And at its, at its peak, this hospital had 3,000 patients. Uh, and it had lots of patients with Huntington's disease, as did state hospitals all over the country. Uh, I've made multiple field trips here to see patients with the disease. The hospital, when I first went there, had its own neurologist. It was so big and so busy and had so many people with neurologic diseases, especially Huntington's at Western State had its own neurologist whom I met. And he told me about this family. He said, this is the worst choreic family I have ever seen. And you can see why he said that. The people in black are the people who had Huntington's disease. And it's one, two, three, that's five generations. Uh, and, every, and in the last three generations, I've got everybody in the family and most people had it. You know, it's a 50-50 risk, but sometimes uh, it comes out to be a lot of people. And almost every single person in this family was institutionalized in a state hospital in Ohio, in South Dakota, Eastern State Hospital, uh, Western State Hospital, VA hospitals, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can see why he said this is the worst Korean family I've ever seen. And this woman, generation five, number three, that's the person that I met uh, and knew in the hospital. And you can see in the sixth generation, those eight people are all each at 50% risk for the disease. Uh, Brenda Vickers pointed out this paper, which was published in 1970, and it was a review of 102 patients who had been admitted to a psychiatric asylum in Great Britain. Uh, and so these were mostly from the 1960s. Uh, and it's interesting to see they all had Huntington's disease, but only a third of them were admitted with the diagnosis of Huntington's. So that's the range and expression of this disease that I'm talking about. A lot of them were not recognized as having Huntington's until later in their course. Uh, and it included diagnoses like psychoneurosis, personality disorder, affective state, you can see down there, schizophrenia. Most of the admissions, it was a psychiatric hospital, so most of the admissions were for psychiatric disease of some kind. But two-thirds of the patients weren't admitted with a diagnosis of Huntington's. And the reasons for their admission is also fascinating. Here's the main reason for the admission of each of those 102 people. And the number one reason was violence. I try very hard in my book not to imply that this is a violent disease because it's really not. The majority of people with this disease are not violent. They're perfectly uh, passive and, and don't strike out but it's definitely skewed toward people who are impulsive, antisocial, misbehave, and can be violent. And, and in the last 60 years, this kind of uh, manifestation of disease really hasn't changed. These are still the reasons that people with Huntington's are admitted to Western State Hospital. It's for violence, social and physical deterioration, paranoid delusions, depression, suicide attempts, self-starvation, um, restlessness, insomnia, irritability, headaches, neurotic symptoms. Um, you get the flavor. So I, I mentioned in my book that, so have any of you read uh, Sue Grafton's Alphabet Mystery Series? Are you familiar with that? So she's written, she wrote 20, she was, Working on number 26, she was going through the alphabet, A for autopsy, B for body, C for corpse, D for death, and so on and so forth. She got through, she got through almost the entire alphabet. Uh, they're, they're really kind of they're fascinating uh, mystery stories. And her main character is a private detective named uh, Kinsey Malone, 
And I've read a couple of these books, and I realized that sometimes I felt like Kinsey alone. The books always start with Kinsey, the private detective, sitting in her office, eating a sandwich, drinking a cup of coffee, and the phone rings. And it's an attorney, or it's a policeman, or it's a fireman, uh, or it's a, a plumber, or you know somebody saying, oh, Miss Malone, something awful has happened in the family. You've got to help us. And so I was sitting in my office one day drinking a cup of coffee, and the phone rings. And the person on the phone says, Dr. Bird, you don't know me, but you've seen my sister. My sister has Huntington's disease, and I need to have you call the coroner right now. My sister's son has been shot and killed by the police in our town, and the coroner has his body, and we know because my sister, his mother, had Huntington's disease, he's at risk for Huntington's disease, and he has a little three-year-old daughter. And we in the family, we want to know, is that little girl at risk for Huntington's disease or not? So we told the coroner, you can imagine the family going through this. Guy, this is the guy, he'd been shot and killed by the police, and what they're thinking is, you gotta get a blood sample from the coroner. Uh, and they told the coroner that, they said, the coroner just got a blood sample. Dr. Bird, call the coroner and get that blood sample tested. So I really wasn't sure what to do. I mean, think about it. Who was this guy? Why did the police kill him? Did the coroner really have a blood sample? Um, would a lab test it? Would the, would the coroner be willing to give up the blood sample? Can I find a lab that would test it? Who would be the ordering doctor? Um, who would pay for it, and who would you give the result to? So what I always say when I tell that story is, you've got to read my book to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so the people frequently have these kinds of problems, disinhibition, impulsivity, hostility, antisocial behavior, aggression, gambling, addiction, alcohol, shoplifting, like my man from uh, Walla Walla and his stealing. Uh, and it really raises this issue, and it's another reason this is an important disease, is what is it telling us about mental illness? And well, what is it telling us about social misbehavior? How much of this is due to this brain disease? And how much of it is due to social environment? non-genetic brain disease factors, what role are diseases of the neurons, what, what, what role do they play in mental illness and misbehavior? And I don't have the answer to that, but I can tell you that Huntington's disease is playing some kind of role in those kinds of behaviors in lots of people because it just keeps reoccurring. It's not a coincidence. It occurs over and over again. So in fact, let me just mention that I have two people I describe in the book who were involved with homicide. And in one of them, the man with Huntington's disease was shot and killed by his roommate because he had obvious disease. His roommate was stealing from him. He was taking advantage of him. And it's a perfect example of how vulnerable people with Huntington's disease can be to misbehaving other individuals in society. The other person in my book had Huntington's disease and he shot and killed his roommate and was brought to clinic. And he actually had no movement disorder at all at the time, but he couldn't, he had no excuse, he had no reason, he couldn't, he, he didn't know why he had shot and killed his roommate, but he had, and it was only, he went to prison, and it was only years later I got a phone call from a prison psychologist saying that I would be interested to know that this man has developed quite severe progressive chorea and is in a wheelchair. So terrible vulnerability in people who have the disease and some terrible misbehavior at other times. So coping strategies, how do people and families deal with this disease? Well, there are all kinds of ways I try to give a number of examples. Uh, one of my favorite is a young woman, middle-aged woman, who uh, 
her father had died with a disease, her brother had the disease, she decided to have genetic testing, she did, she was positive, she was employed, professional, doing well. And when I interviewed her about what was the impact of this positive genetic test in her life, she said, well, you know, it made me sad, but I stopped and said, I've always wanted to do a lot of dancing. And I've always put it off because of my career. But when I got this positive test, I said, well, it's now or never. And so she took up dancing and she had a wonderful time and joined a couple of dancing groups. And she said, you know, it actually had kind of a positive effect on my life in that way. So that's the way she coped. I have another patient who just loved to tell jokes. She was always happy. Uh, she was never down when she came to clinic. And she would always greet us with what she called the Huntington's high five. She'd say, hey, Dr. Bird, and she'd want to high five us, and we'd all high five her, and then she'd miss. And she'd laugh uproariously and say, oh, that's the Huntington's high five. Um, and then there was this man who was, in, uh, who was around 70 years old, and he was an attorney, uh, and he became very anxious and depressed to the degree that he could no longer perform. And he was kind of put on uh, uh, leave by his law office. Uh, and he had no family history of Huntington's disease. He had no movement disorder. He went to see psychiatrists and he was so depressed he got ECT electric shock treatment, electric convulsive treatment. And most people in the general community don't know what an ECT machine looks like, so there you go. And those are the, the electrodes down at the bottom. So he got ECT, he got, a, he got a, a round of 10 ECT treatments and he did not get better. So the psychiatrist said, well, we just need to do more. So they did another 10 and he got worse. His anxiety got worse, he got more confused, and they said, well, we need to do more. So they did another round of 10, he got much worse. Um, uh, his anxiety got worse, his depression got worse, uh, and uh, he got very confused. But he and his wife were not confused enough, they decided to switch psychiatrists, which they did, and they came to a psychiatrist who said, let's try a magnet. And so there's this thing called TMS, transmagnetic stimulation, which has become popular in the last few years in psychiatry. Uh, it's just putting a magnet over the brain, and I don't know all the details. I can't tell you a lot about it. it sounds kind of hokey to me. Uh, but in fact, there's a fair literature on treating depression with this in, instead of ECT, uh, and patients often get better. And he had this treatment, and he got psychiatrically better. He clearly improved. His anxiety got better. His depression got better. His mind cleared. He and his wife were very happy with this. While he was going through this, the second psychiatrist noted that he was getting jerky and jumpy, sent him to a neurologist who said, well, you have no, you have no history of Huntington's disease, but I want to be complete. I don't want to leave any stone unturned, so I'm going to do this genetic test on you going to be negative, but let's be complete, and it was positive. Uh, and so he turned out to have Huntington's disease, and after this treatment, he eventually developed a chorea, he developed rigidity, he became very ill, neurologically progressed, and eventually died of Huntington's disease. But he had probably a year of improvement from this treatment, I think. Uh, and I believe that his severe depression and anxiety that he presented with was probably his early presentation of Huntington's disease. Another very common phenomenon in this disease is lack of awareness. It used to be called denial, but it's not really conscious. People aren't consciously denying their problems, but lack of awareness is very common. They're not aware of their movement disorder. They're not aware of their problems with judgment. They're not aware that they've got the disease. And it makes it very difficult to treat them because they don't think there's anything wrong. They don't need, they don't need to walk with a, a walker because they're not having any trouble. And they fall and hurt themselves. They don't need to take their medication because there's nothing wrong with them. Um, 
And this particular man I talk about in the chapter on lack of awareness, uh, he was 60 some years old and his father had died with Huntington's and he was under the impression that if he made it to 60, he wouldn't develop the disease. So he was very happy when he made it to 60, but then he developed Korea, but he didn't believe he had Korea. And so his doctor said, well, go see a neurologist. He came to see us uh, and he said, I don't have it, but I want to prove I don't have it. So go ahead and test me. So we tested him and it was positive. And he said, well, of course the test is wrong. I don't have the disease, the test is wrong. And he went out of state and got tested in a different lab by a different group of physicians. And the result was the same. And so he said, well, I realize I've inherited the gene from my father, but I don't have the disease. That went, on, that went on for a very long time, really very serious lack of, uh, lack of awareness, and it, it interfered with our ability to care for it. And there's so much negative that I can say about this disease that I tried to bend over backwards to say some positive things, and you can say some positive things. And one of the most positive is that people can have this disease and have a very successful, productive uh, lifestyle and career. And this is, just, this is just a list of examples of people I've seen who went on to develop Huntington's, but they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were college professors, they were cabinet makers, they were musicians, they were scientists. The list goes on and on. They did very well, were very successful. Think of how much Woody Guthrie contributed to our society, even though he went on to have this disease. And this was perhaps one of my most interesting examples of that. So this young man is in his 20s and he's on the front cover of Esquire magazine in the 1970s. And he was a very successful male model, fashion model. And he spent time in Rome and London and Paris uh, and had quite a life and quite a career as a very successful fashion, fashion model. This was his first gig. He, he was a very handsome guy uh, and he got himself put on the cover of Esquire magazine. But his mother had died of Huntington's disease and he pushed it aside and tried not to think about it. But later on, he started developing poor coordination and movement disorder and dysarthria and came to us and sure enough had Huntington's disease. Uh, he's still alive today and he's in uh, an adult family home uh, in uh, basically the advanced stage of disease, terminal care. Uh, but he's my only patient I've ever had who's been on the cover of a national magazine. This disease has tremendous impact on families uh, and employment. There are families that are completely destroyed and broken by this disease. There are a few families that I've seen where they actually were brought closer together by the disease. So that can happen, it's unpredictable. Um, <laughs> and money problems are huge because it, typical age of onset is in the 40s and people die in their 50s. The duration of the disease is typically about 15 years or so. Um, uh, and people lose their jobs, like my attorney. Um, and it's at the, the peak need of their families for their, for their salaries and their income, and they lose it all. Um, they often don't have insurance. They can end up in state hospitals. We have people with Huntington's who are living in tents underneath I-5, uh, and that frequently happens to individuals with this disease. Uh, and that's why I say it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's like the, the canary in the coal mine of mental illness. How do we take care of people who have a progressive degenerative brain disease and they're called mentally ill uh, and they have no money, no insurance, and they're living in a tent under I-5? But what do we do with them? Well, what's our commitment to them? Uh, 
we just want to have a child. So um, an adoption, I've got him on the same slide because I had a woman who was adopted. She and her husband were trying to have children uh, and they were having a lot of trouble having a child. And one day she got a phone call informing her that her father had Huntington's disease. And she was like in her late twenties, had no idea about that. And she and her husband were decided to continue to try to have children. They had prenatal diagnosis when she got pregnant and the fetus was positive for the Huntington gene. They had decided they would terminate pregnancy if that was the case, and so they did. And then they went on to have pre-implantation diagnosis and in vitro fertilization, and they had embryos tested for, pre for implantation, and all of the embryos were positive for Huntington's disease. So they finally gave up. They did no more uh, prenatal testing and just had a child. And they did have a child. The child did not have Huntington's disease, but the child had a severe chromosomal rearrangement. Um, and then they went on to have a second child who they haven't tested in any way. And so far, that child is normal. Uh, but adoption often plays a role in this disease. We have lots of people who are adopted and find out one way or another that they have a disease, either because they develop symptoms and they get tested, or as an adult, someone informs them about their true family history. And it's not surprising because women with this disease uh, often can't raise children, often are not married, and give up their children for adoption. So I showed you at the beginning a little five-year-old boy with juvenile Huntington's disease. This girl is our princess in pink. Her mother died in her 30s with Huntington's disease. She was a perfectly normal little girl until she was about seven years old, and then she started getting clumsy on the playground. Her grandmother knew that she was at risk for Huntington's, took her to be seen at Children's Hospital. She eventually got tested. She had uh, something like 82 CAG repeats. She had juvenile Huntington's disease. And her teacher was told that, and her teacher was a marvelous person who said, we're not gonna hide this. She's having coordination problems. There's obviously something wrong with her. So the children are gonna know about it. We're gonna talk about Huntington's disease. We're gonna talk about her. We're gonna support her and bring her into our classroom. And they did. And one of the things they did was they, pu they printed this uh, booklet called Princess in Pink. And every child in the class did a page. Where they drew a picture of her in pink. And then they wrote a little paragraph of what they thought about her, why they liked her for one reason or another. And so there, there are like 30 pages in the book. This is one where she's, she's uh, strong and performing in the Olympics. And she was able to have the same teacher for three years in a row, I think like fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. It was a wonderful experience and a great teacher, uh, and thank God for her. Uh, but she eventually got worse and worse and could no longer go to school, and she died when she was about uh, 15 years old of juvenile Huntington's disease. And this is the problem with juvenile. I told you that it's typically 15 or so years for the duration of the disease, but on the left, the, this is a, a you know, age versus death graph, and the blue is typical adult Huntington's disease, um, and uh, the red is juvenile Huntington's disease. And over here, they've separated juvenile into those with a repeat expansion under 80 and a repeat expansion over 80. And it's even worse if you have a larger repeat expansion. So typically people with juvenile Huntington's only live for about uh, eight or nine years instead of 15 or 17. The disease can be very embarrassing. Uh, and I mentioned that it can lead to uh, neglect and uh, they're very vulnerable. They're often accused of being drunk, accused of being intoxicated, uh, and they're not. 
I mentioned a guy who got kicked off a Seattle Metro bus because the bus driver thought he was intoxicated and he just was uncoordinated and it was very embarrassing to him. Um, and they're often falling, they're often hitting their head, breaking bones. And this is a person with a large subdural hematoma. She had Huntington's disease. And all that happened to her was she was coming down the stairs at home and she fell on her bottom on the stairs and went down three or four stairs, bump, bump, bump. She doesn't, as far as she knows, she never hit her head, but she just hit her spine, the bottom of her spine, really hard. And a few days later, she got terrible headache uh, and weakness and got taken to the emergency room, had this CT scan, uh, and had a big subdural. It was actually removed by the neurosurgeons, and she got lots better. But she's one of many people we've seen with this disease who have developed subdurals. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a real risk in this disease because the brain is, is atrophying. Uh, and the spaces between the brain and the skull are enlarging. And it doesn't take much of a hit on the head to have this happen. And I've had people who have herniated and died with big subdurals, one of which was just this past year. I have a chapter called Reservation Blues. I talk about Johnny and Jerry Gray Eagle. That's not their real name, but they're two brothers who were Native Americans living on a reservation and their mother had died with Huntington's disease and their father burned down the house, was alcoholic and then disappeared. And so they had a very traumatic childhood and they tried to make it as best they can. They dug, they were clam diggers, they were gooey duck diggers. Uh, they worked in 7-Eleven stores. One of them became a semi-professional boxer. They didn't do too well. And then they both developed Huntington's disease, and we've followed them for years in clinic, and they're in a, a tribe that doesn't have resources. Some tribes have big casinos and have some resources. This particular tribe has almost no resources, and their life, from our perspective, has been pretty sad, but from their perspective, it's sort of interesting how kind of upbeat and carefree they are uh, every time they come to clinic. And I mentioned that one of the diseases this is similar to is schizophrenia. And that's because delusions, hallucinations, psychotic features are not rare in the disease. I would say at least five to 10% of our patients with Huntington's have delusions or hallucinations of some type and act psychotic. We've had two people, one in their 60s, one in their 30s, who both said, they felt the devil was inside them, whispering to them and telling them to injure other people around them. Diabolical possession. Uh, they were treated with antipsychotics and it kind of calmed them down, although the voices never really went away. So summing up, you know, uh, we still don't have a good treatment for this disease. I think we have a wonderful team here at the UW taking care of these patients. And the key factors are to have compassion for them, to be determined to help them and not to give up, to be patient and to hang in there and do the best you can. I came across a book about the experience of the uh, Japanese Americans in the uh, internment camps during World War II. And in there, one of the Japanese person said, we think of, we, we use the word gammon, that's the English pronunciation of it. And it was, it was defined as the impressive ability to endure the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. I like that a lot. And I think it has a, a bearing on Huntington's disease. Uh, but there may be light at the end of the tunnel. And this is a paper published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And as many of you know, scientists are working very hard to try and find an effective treatment for this disease. And there are at least five or six of slightly different varieties in the pipeline. And a couple of them are uh, antisense oligonucleotide approaches. 
that's what this is. Uh, and there are something like 100 people or so in three different countries getting intrathecal ASOs to try and treat this disease and shut down the effect of the, the abnormal uh, gene. Um, and so far, it hasn't hurt them. And they can measure Huntington protein in the spinal fluid, and the Huntington protein has gone down. So there's hope, but there has been no release of clinical information so far, but that should show up next year and uh, see how things are going. So it's, it's very hopeful, and if this doesn't work, maybe something similar to it will. And lastly, I very much want to thank my colleagues here at the UW who are in the uh, HDSA Center of Excellence who have helped me over the years. I mentioned Amelia Schultz, who's now 104, and yes, she's retired. <laughs> but all of these people, neurologists, social workers, nurses, genetic counselors, have been very helpful. And this is the team approach that you need to take care of patients with this, uh, with this terrible disease. Thank you very much. We have to take a couple of questions. Yes. Have we come any closer to discovering what the normal Huntington gene does? So we've come closer, but no one knows for sure. There are a lot of candidate functions for it. It probably has more than one function. And I can send you a article that lists about six of those potential functions. But in fact, it doesn't have one single function that's a, that everyone agrees on is the, the, the normal function of the protein. But clearly, it has a normal function. If you knock it out in mouse uh, model, uh, it's embryonic lethal. So it's doing something very important. Yes? Do very young patients have a longer expansion than his father? Yes. How so, often do you see changes in this generation? So his expansion was 160. Yeah. His father was 52. Uh, and the general rule of thumb is that when the expansion is transmitted to the child, it stays about the same. Yeah the vast majority of the time. The next most common thing that happens is that it enlarges. The least common thing, but does happen, is it actually sometimes shrinks and gets a little smaller. And, it, and it, there are two, or at least there are several things that impact whether it expands to a large degree or not. One is the sex of the parent. That happens much more commonly when the father is the affected parent. And the size of the parent's CAG, his was 52, which is already pretty big. So it was already more unstable than say a 41. Uh, and that little girl, the princess in pink, her mother, she had a maternal transmission, but her mother I mentioned died in her 30s, and her mother also had a very a large expansion. Was the alternate, just the other allele, which is presumably normal range for virtually everyone, but within the normal range, does it matter if it's slightly longer? No, it does not seem to have any effect. So there's no gender difference with whether it's inherited maternally or maternally. Because there are other diseases where it's... No, no I, I said, it's, it's more likely, juvenile is more likely to be inherited from the father. About 70 to 80 percent of the time, juvenile is inherited by the father, from the father. So there is a difference. Yes. On that kind of most of the examples you mentioned, and in the book of criminality um, or violence, looking at men, is does there seem to be a gender effect on the psychiatric or behavioral manifestations, or what's your thoughts on that? So uh, I think that's a good observation. You know, we certainly have women who have been very misbehaving and violent. So there's no question that that happens. It does seem to happen more often with men and to be more severe with men. And my guess is that reflects the normal background. Would you agree with that? <laughs> that men, men have a tendency to be more violent. And so you see that, but, but we definitely have had women who have had a problem with, uh, with the violence and abusing other people in the family. Yes? You, you mentioned the age at which 
most of the agency are dying, but they usually have had something in retrospect for a decade or like psychiatric. So the, so, the, so the age of onset thing is really interesting issue. And, and it's, it's changing in many ways. The age of onset traditionally, years ago, was always when someone began to have movements that a physician recognized as an abnormal movement. That was the age of onset. And most of the graphs of duration and age of onset are based on that. It then became clear that there can be psychiatric manifestations of this disease, uh, and that's really the age of onset. And so there, but it's harder to measure, it's harder to document, and it's more likely to overlap with normal behavior. I mean, if you're depressed, why are you depressed? If you're an anxious, why are you anxious? So, but the, it, but people are beginning to say you need to look at psychiatric onset, and that has moved the onset earlier in more recent studies. In addition to that, people have done very detailed, now that the, the genetic test is available, they've done detailed imaging studies of the brain in people who have inherited the mutation and are perfectly normal, and they've showed atrophy of the caudate and the putamen 10 years or more before the onset of any kind of symptoms. And there's a recent paper just out of the University of Iowa on children who have inherited the mutation and were studied and didn't get the, their result. They, they agreed they didn't want their, their CHE repeat expansion, but it was known to re researchers eventually. And they did imaging on the children and they could show changes in the striatum in children who had mutation sizes where you would expect an adult onset. So the truth is, this disease begins when the sperm fertilizes the egg, right? That's when the disease begins. And so when does it begin in the brain and what are the manifestations of that? It probably goes back very, very early. And that impacts when are you going to treat the disease? When should you treat the disease? If you're treating people, adults who are symptomatic, that may be too late. It's the same argument that's going on in Alzheimer's. It's treating people with Alzheimer's when they're demented, maybe it's too late. But how do you know when to treat people if you think you have an effective treatment? Yeah, great question. Yes? Have you clinically encountered patients with the, the Huntington's tube gene, the gene that gets much more common in people with Yes. Could you describe its profile in comparison to? So it was, it was, uh, it, it could not be distinguished from Huntington's disease. Really? Yes, it looked exactly like Huntington's disease, including doing an MRI and seeing the caudate atrophy. Just like Huntington's disease. That's why it's called HD2. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was amazingly similar. Completely, completely different genes. And the genetics are similar in the sense that the level of expansion. I, I don't know how well this expansion size relates to the phenotype, but I, I don't recall that. Yes? You, you focus a lot on like the outliers and extreme cases. Of I like outliers. <laughs> what, about the, what about the garden variety of hunting patients that you saw in the beginning of your clinic versus now? Has there been any kind of shift in the general profile of that? So it's a very good question, and, and the answer is yes, there has. It's not that the disease has changed, but the ability to do the genetic test has really changed what we're seeing in clinic. And the way it's changed is that we're picking up more and more people who don't develop the disease until late in life. So that man who was 92 years old, his father, it turns out, had the disease, and we were able to get his father's medical records and he had a movement disorder in his 70s and 80s. Uh, and it was just, and he was having psychiatric problems, so he was put on Haldol. And when he developed the movement disorder, they said, oh, it's just a side effect of Haldol. The diagnosis was never made. Uh, and, but now you just do a blood test. And so we're seeing lots more later onset disease because of the uh, advent of the blood test. And that's the same with the juvenile cases where 
if they were adopted, for example, or the family history wasn't known, they often don't have chorea. That little boy mostly had ataxia, and they get kind of dystonic and rigid, and you might not think of an infant disease, but now you do a screen and you get it. So we, we actually are seeing more of the extremes because of the availability of the test. Yes, John. It's along those same lines. How underdiagnosed? It, well, it's clearly, I don't know how much, but it's clearly underdiagnosed. And I, I, a, a nice example was that 1970 paper that showed the various diagnoses that these people can have. And if they don't have a family history and they don't have chorea, it's frequently not diagnosed. And in today's world, you know, neurologists and doctors are doing these exome panels, and you would miss it. You'd miss it because it's a repeat expansion and you don't see it in the exome panel. So you got these people with unusual neurologic disease and you don't know what it is and you do an exome panel, it comes back negative and you miss the diagnosis. Um, so obviously the type of disease you could be a variability of the expression of the disease and the age of onset, which is fascinating so much. Can you tell us about any other modifiers uh, for Huntington's so the, so the biggest modifier that's just been reported this year is an interruption in the repeat expansion. So there's an interruption in that repeat expansion that varies in its frequency in the population and in its size. And two different groups have said that makes a huge impact on age of onset. So I think that's now just become accepted as a, as a major genetic modifier. There are other genes that have been reported in GWAS kinds of studies as modifying a disease. They, they may, but they don't have the same size of effect at that interruption. Yes? Hi. Can you, can you repeat the question from here that are from, yes. in my opinion, marginalized communities do this um, And so what, what is your take on these patients? Are there any populations that are more effective than ACI. I also know there's the two possibility. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so there, there are uh, pretty substantial uh, ethnic studies that have been done. Uh, and there are two populations that clearly have a much lower frequency and prevalence of this disease, and that is uh, blacks and Asians. And they're, 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 they have much more levels of the disease. There's a study has been done of South Africa where the population was divided into relatively pure whites, relatively pure blacks, and the mixed uh, category. And the prevalences were very clearly related to that. The, pure, the purest black community that they could find had almost no CHG expansions at all. And they rarely saw cases of the disease. Uh, and I and, uh, just have a colleague that came back from China and China has about the same number, this is all, you know, in, in quotes and big ranges, but China has about the same number of people with Huntington's disease as our country, and the population is what, three or four times our population. So the, the proportion is actually much smaller in, uh, in Asian populations. But, and, there's also some evidence that it's smaller in Native Americans, but big studies haven't been done. And our two brothers, for example, probably when talking to the family, it sounds like a uh, Caucasian brought the gene into the family three generations back. Okay, so currently working on projects where it's dealing with Native Americans in those places would be and um, the access to the diagnosis and treatment. And so it seems that there's many hurdles to this people. There are many groups and hurdles to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we'd love to talk to you about that. Because we have, we have, I think, three or four Native American families that have this disease, and they all have had uh, resource problems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much.